Joan Herman, and this is Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Thanks for joining me today. My guest today is Maggie Callanan. Maggie has spent her professional career as a hospice nurse caring for the terminally ill. She is the co-author of the book, Final Gifts, Understanding the Special Awareness Needs and Communication of the Dying, and she's the author of Final Journeys, A Practical Guide for Bringing Care and Comfort at the End of Life. Maggie speaks on topics relating to the care of the dying, as well as coping strategies for hospice staff and volunteers. Maggie, welcome to the show. I want to say in the very beginning that for me personally, I, I am very honored that you are here. Thank you, John. Your book, Final Gifts, was given to me back in 2001. I had just gone through the process of, of dealing with my father losing his battle with lung cancer. Uh -huh. and, and in the few months prior to his death, I experienced a lot of what you talk about in the book and, and what we'll get into. And one of the things that, that struck me, um, and this book was given to me by my best friend Lisa right after my father passed away, and, and I wish I had it prior to that. Uh -huh. When my dad came home two days before he passed away, he was sent home, and, and I had gone out to the ambulance transport in front of the home, and, and as soon as they took him out of it, he looked directly at me, and he said, I came home to die. Aww. And, and what I immediately did was kick into my rah-rah mode, and I was mm -hmm. like, oh, the dad, you know, you're getting better and hang in there mm -hmm. and fight. And, and after I read the book, I realized, and I don't, I don't want to say it was the wrong thing to do because there isn't anything wrong to do, but it wasn't the best thing that I could have done for my father at that time. Um, because, well, no, Joan, but you're a parent. Is there anything that your child could do that was wrong? No, no, and, th <laughs> and that's why I say I don't like to use that word. But Sure. I read he knew. The book. He understood. He understood. Well, exactly. And, and then in the book, you talk about how it's important that we give them permission to pass. And, yeah. and I just did that this past August when my, my mom was dying. I know she was holding on because for the months prior to that, she kept talking about wanting to go home, and, and she was home. So I knew what she was referring to. Mm -hmm. And two days before she passed away, I had a conversation with her, and I, and I told her that I'm very strong, that I am cut from the same cloth that she is, that she raised me well, that my, my kids and I will be fine. Mm -hmm. And I told her to do what you want to do, what you need to do, and it's okay. Mm -hmm. And two days later, she passed away. So I have to tell you, I, I thank you for that. And that came to me, that wisdom from your book, Final Gifts. Well, thank you. I appreciate that comment. That came to, to us from our patients. You know, we had the finest teachers, so the whole, the whole field of death and dying was uh, pretty much uncharted territory, believe it or not. We only discovered the truth about death and dying in the 1970s when Elizabeth Kubler-Ross wrote her books on death and dying. You know, prior to that, it was the failure of a medical process. Mm -hmm. But, you know, she opened the doors for the other layers of the journey, not just the physical, and of course to most people and to families, the emotional, spiritual, psychological uh, layers of the journey are far more important than what's happening to your blood pressure. Well, and you talk about near-death awareness. What mm -hmm. does that actually mean? It's actually nearing death awareness. And, and what uh, my co-author, Pat Kelly, and I started noticing patterns in the language and behavior of our dying patients. Uh, that seemed to intensify as they got closer, nearer and nearer to death. Uh, both of us were familiar with the term near-death experience, which I think is fairly well known um, now by most people, and that's the when you have a heart attack, drowning, auto accident, a very rapid, dramatic experience of seeing the light, being out of your body, feeling free of pain, uh, having reunions with people. Uh, there's many, many components of the NDE, and I am a former critical care nurse, so I was involved in many, many resuscitations and saw this play out in front of me, but couldn't get my medical staff to acknowledge this. We were sort of closing our eyes to it. Uh, then I start working for hospice, work with Pat Kelly, and we started noticing unique patterns in the language and the behavior of our dying patients that felt similar but were very profoundly different. We cataloged them, basically. Maggie, were there any commonalities among these patients? Were all of them um, heavily sedated? Did all of no. them have the same disease? And I'm glad you asked that because I can't tell you, we lost a few years before we ever published because we asked all those same questions. Were they all on morphine? Did they all have disease that had spread to their brains or their livers or their kidneys? Um, was it because of the medications? Was it because they weren't getting enough oxygen to their brain? What was going on with the chemistry in their blood that may have caused confusion? 
and we could not find a commonality. It was happening more profoundly even with children who, of course, are not acculturated to be afraid. Uh, so they were regaling us with phenomenal stories of the angels and the castles in the sky and the beautiful butterflies that they were seeing. Um, it happens... It seems to happen more easily again to the to the real elderly who may have grown up in a farm and grandma died by the stove in the kitchen because it was the heat source and they heard her calling her dead husband and they saw her reaching and waving for things unseen. So that generation is far more comfortable with it. Once we opened hospitals and we sterilized death and dying and put bed rails up between the dying and their loved ones, uh, and had visiting hours and no children allowed and no pets allowed, uh, we sanitized death and dying and made it into a strange process again. Once upon a time, it was not. Maggie, you say that when, when someone we love is dying, you know, usually we don't know what to do or say, and you believe that if we listen and if we know what to look for, the dying often provide the answers for us. You say that communication usually falls into two categories. Yes, when we cataloged the stories, it was that was sort of all we did. The book wrote itself from that point on because the categories were very clear. There were two main categories. Um, and, and let me just step back for a moment. One of the most unnerving questions for me when I first started working at hospice was patients would grab my hand and say, tell me what it feels like to die. Well, and I'd have to honestly say I haven't. I can't tell you from my own personal experience, but I have witnessed to this date now in excess of 2,000 deaths, and you certainly see patterns and learn things, and I was always happy to share that with my patients because it was not frightening news. Um, so in any case, in the first category of messages, our dying patients are actually telling us what it feels like to die. And once again, it has nothing to do with blood pressure or pulse or, you know, liver functions. Uh, you know, they're talking about uh, being in the presence of someone who is not alive, someone that we can't see, typically a spouse or a loved one that has predeceased us. Sometimes it's a spiritual being. They talk about uh, going someplace, as you said with your mother, she was going home. Uh, that's very common. I, I heard it in the hospital all the time, and it made sense to me, but now suddenly I'm in people's homes, and they're telling me they want to go home. Then you really have to say, what home are we talking about here? Right. They told us that they could see a wonderful place, a place that was very appealing to them, a place that they wanted to go, many lifestyle parallels there. For example, a golfer saw a wonderful tournament. An artist saw a city of lights across the river. These things have parallels. And the thing that was so surprising, I mean, all of this was surprising to us, but they showed us that they actually knew when they were going to die, and that's even if the doctors and nurses didn't. So, for example, a nurse would go around and say goodbye to her patients because she was going on a two-week vacation, and one patient would say, I won't be here when you come back. And no matter how healthy that patient was, we, we caution families and nurses to listen very carefully because often they have a knowledge of when their death will occur that we don't have. That's all wonderful news. We don't die alone. We're preparing for this journey. It doesn't come up and catch us off guard. We see a beautiful place that we're going, and we know when it's going to happen. That takes away the passive, terrified aspect that most people feel dying is. Now, Maggie, before you move on, do you find that when people are passing that they do get a sense of peace at the very end? You know, it's, it's unfair to make a blanket statement for everybody because our dying is as unique as our living has been. Our dying is the ultimate signature on our life story. Certainly, and, and also I have to shade it by saying when there are medical interventions like respirators and, um, you know, tubes and all of that stuff, it often changes the profile of dying because dying is sort of prolonged and dragged out. Mm -hmm. But the natural peaceful death that we see at home is surprising that it's so peaceful and quiet that actually sometimes families miss it. You know, they're sitting in the room chatting and suddenly they realize mom's no longer breathing. I mean, it's just not a big uproar. Mm -hmm. Deaths in a hospital tend to be a big uproar, and I'm not criticizing hospitals. Thank God that they're rescuing the rescuable. People with terminal illness are not rescuable. So it's really not the best place for terminal, terminally ill people to be. But I also recognize that, that loving families do the very best they can, and not every family can have somebody dying at home. Okay, so Maggie, now what is the second 
communication category? The second category is that the, that the dying person is making requests of us to finish unfinished business so that they can be free to go on, much like you're giving permission to your mother. They actually, in this category, my favorite, uh, I think you're going to have. I think you're going to hear me say my favorite to every one of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but in this category, choosing the time of death, and I think many of your audience can remember when Grandma waited for the grandson to come from California, uh, for the baby to be born. Uh, anniversaries are very important. The first six years I worked for hospice, we never had a death on Christmas. Uh, those poor little folks were struggling to stay alive so they wouldn't ruin the holiday for their families. But the day after Christmas, it was awful. <laughs> you know, it was like everybody was dying because they made the deadline. Uh, so there is an ability to choose the moment, not to stop the process. But a very important component of this is that people don't realize that the dying people sometimes choose the moment when the people they care about the most are not present. I, I hear that a, all the time. Someone it will is say, a gift we've, yeah, of we've, we've held a vigil 24 hours a day for three weeks, and the one minute I went down for a cup of coffee. See? See? It, it, that happens all the time. And this was with your mother? Um, actually, yes. We were with my mother all day. Okay. We left well, and, and at about 8 o'clock at night, yeah, and she died 12.30 in the morning. The final gift of mothering that your mother gave you was to spare you seeing her leave. And, you know, and the interesting thing, we had a caregiver who was spending time. I, I had a live-in for my mom, and mm-hmm. when I would run in and out during the day, the woman stayed with my mom. And the next mm-hmm. day, when I went to the house to tell her that my mom passed, she said to me, who's Vincent? And I said, well, that's my brother who passed away. And she said that the one of the last things my mom had said that day was that, Vincent was here. See? Yeah, so I, I, That's what I, I mean. We don't die that. alone. We don't die alone. You know, those who are predeceased come for us and help us. Um, and to me, that's a very comforting thought. When we see our loved ones and they're calling out to people or they're reaching out, and mm-hmm. a lot of times I think sometimes we tend to just chalk that up to them being incoherent or being drugged. When right. we do that, are we missing something? Yes, we absolutely are. I would like your audience, if they take one thing away from this show, to take away the fact that when we think someone is confused in the dying process, we are the ones who are confused. How do people that are dying reveal their feelings? What are things that we can look for? Well, sometimes they'll say things like, I had a dream, but it really wasn't a dream, because these experiences are extremely real to our dying people, and they on some level understand that it's odd, uh, that they sort of have a foot in two worlds. The way I like to describe it, and I'm really dating myself now, do you remember the old brownie Hawkeye cameras where if you didn't advance the film, you got two pictures on one negative? Sadly, I do. (laughs) Okay, yes, (laughs) with the great big flash bulb thing. Uh, (laughs) um, I think we may have lost a good percentage of your audience with that image, but um, two images on one film, on one picture, I think is what the experience is like. I mean, I have sat for hours and hours and hours and hours and watched this so that I could help people understand it. And I think it's like two images on one negative, a foot in two worlds. Some of what they're saying belongs to this world. Some of what they're saying belongs to the world that we cannot see. And uh, we're so busy diagnosing and fixing that we're sometimes fixing things that don't need to be fixed. So my message is don't be too quick to medicate or label someone confused because then you ignore them. You don't listen to what they're saying. They can't be saying anything important. You know, doctors and nurses have fancy labels, anoxia and metabolic imbalance and blah, blah, blah. Families say things like she's out of it now. You know, Aunt Tilly's lost her buttons. We can put Uncle Willie in the nursing home. He doesn't know who he is anymore. That's the family's brand of labels. But the one thing that's missing is that no one's listening to the words. Buried in the words are just some lovely, lovely messages that will give us peace in our own grieving. It will also change the way we view our own dying. Maggie, that's why I love the title of your book, Final Gifts, because I know when I was going through the process with my father, Mm -hmm. my parish priest, I had gone to him for counsel, and, and he had said to me that even though it's one of the most horrific times that I'm going through in my life, mm-hmm. there are precious gifts that can be yes. found if we take the time to look for them. And, exactly. And, you know, looking back, taking my dad for chemo and mm-hmm. radiation and, and watching it, I don't think I would have traded a, a moment of that okay. because I got to see my father for a human being and mm-hmm. I got to see his emotions mm-hmm. that I never experienced before. And I looked at him in a different way. And had I not gone through that with him, you wouldn't have. I w- right. I wouldn't have seen him for the man that he was. 
you know, I hear wonderful comments from families who are granted, exhausted, dragged out. Nobody wants this to happen. But I've heard people say it's the hardest job I ever loved. Exactly, and that is so true. Because there, it's, an, it's the final opportunity for treasured moments. You know, it's what I say to my families. We're going to stop worrying about what this cancer is doing, and we're going to start focusing on making memories. In doing this job that you do, and, and I don't believe that it's a job. I believe you have a quality. Oh, it's, oh, it's, it, it's, it's a quality. Life, yes. I mean, to do what you yeah. do, you are an angel on earth, and oh, that is please. a quality. Uh, you know, anybody who works with me would tell you that I'm far more of a bulldog. <laughs> um, but truthfully, God gives you angels, and going through a dying process, you need a bulldog. You shared a story with me that I would really love for you to share with the listeners because it's, it's about the importance of grieving. Oh, yeah. Can you share the toll road story with us, please? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I love that story. <laughs> uh, it's a true story, and I wrote it because I saw so many of the most wonderful, I mean, so many joys in working for hospice. One of them is certainly the type of people that are drawn to the work. They are just exceptionally wonderful, wonderful people. Um, but I was always distressed that so many of them were crashing and burning because they couldn't sort of control, you know, have boundaries and keep, you know, work where work belongs and then keep family where family belongs and try not to cross that up. And it's a little bit hard uh, because it certainly is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week concern. And we get very involved with our patients and families. So anyway, I decided that the reason we were losing people was that they weren't grieving, you know, I was losing an average of 80 patients a year. That's a lot of people to lose. So I decided, since I didn't want to crash and burn, that I would have a place to grieve. And I chose the toll road. I lived outside of Washington, D.C. I chose the toll road that spanned the last 15 miles home and that I would grieve. And I also didn't want to go home in tears to my young children all the time. Um, so I got so good at this, Joan, that I could feel my throat getting tight as I came up over the hill and approached the main toll booth. And, you know, I was already crying by the time I'd get there. And I don't just mean sniffle, sniffle, tear coming down the cheek. I mean mouth agape wailing. The better you do it, the less it hurts you, okay? That's mm -hmm. an important message to your audience. Mm -hmm. Don't be shy about grieving. Mm -hmm. Holler and scream and make noise. Um, so I, I would be doing this. And, of course, I'd miss the basket when I threw my quarter. It's not a quarter anymore. Um, and the guy would wave me and go on, it's so fine, I'll get it, you know. And this went on day after day after day for a long time, probably nearly a year. One day I was sent to admit the mother of a large uh, Irish family that lived in the town past mine on the toll road. And I opened, you know, rang the bell, opened the door, and a son answered the door, and suddenly his face was stricken. He looked at my name tag, it said hospice on it, we always wear our name tags. Um, and I thought, you know, we had a doctor in town who just had such a hard time telling his patients that there was nothing more that he could do for them that he would just send us. <laughs> and so, you know, the door would open and the family's like, why are you here? And we're going, oh, oh. Lord, these people weren't told. I mean, you know, oh, I know goodness. he, well, I know he cared a lot, but, uh, you know, we took a party platter to his office and we <laughs> helped him see the error of his ways. <laughs> <laughs> He's a very caring guy. Okay. Um, so I thought, oh, this is the patient of, one, of, of this doctor. I am not getting in this house. And I kept standing there looking, and he was looking at me. I'm, I can't describe the look of horror on his face. And suddenly it was like a light bulb went on. And he said, oh, my gosh, now I get it. He was one of the tall <laughs> <operators. laughs> And he said to me after I admitted his mother and got her all tucked in, he walked out to the driveway and he said to me, you have no idea how much we talked about you. <laughs> What's with this woman who goes by in the morning with a big smile on her face and she's singing with the radio and every afternoon she's going home screaming and wailing in tears. And he said one of the young toll booth operators was feeling very responsible for me and we should do something and maybe this woman is battered or abused or <laughs> Whatever, he was just needing, he was waiting for me to come into his little lane. There were nine lanes. And if I did, he was going to shout to me, dump the bum. <laughs> <laughs> and the moral of the story is it's okay to grieve. Everybody accepts oh, absolutely. it. It's okay to grieve and to feel it. Well, and you know, from that point on, and this was before Speed Pass, which I now have, so this was a while ago. At that point on, any time I'd go through a toll lane, they'd all, hey, nurse, and they'd all come out of their booths and wave. You know, we shared a journey of grieving, 
Mm -hmm. that they weren't involved in. But grief is such a part of life. An important part. Very important part. Especially for healing. Oh, especially for healing. So do it well and do it loudly. Maggie, I hate to say this, but we are out of time. No. And there is so much that I want to talk about. I always have so much more to say. That's okay, because we're going to have you back to say it, because this is very important. I'd like that. If our listeners would like more information about Maggie and her book, Final Gifts, you can visit our website, cyacyl.com, which stands for Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. While on the website, look at our digital publication, Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life 24-7, and listen to past shows as podcasts. Maggie, Again, this has meant so much to me to have you here today. Thank you, Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure for me. Thank you for the opportunity. This is Joan Herman, and this is Change Your Attitude, Change Your Life. Thanks for tuning in.